Hi, welcome to Cooper Hewitt's Symposium Part 1, Fashion, Cultures, Futures. I'm happy to be here with you all. This is the panel, Sustainable Fashion Practice from Africa to North America. And I am Teju. I am a Jamaican-American poet, researcher, writer, and geographer based in Oakland, California, which is the unceded territory of the Ohlone people, the Chechenyo speaking Ohlone people specifically. And I'm happy to be here with Tahir. We had a third panelist, Abrima, who unfortunately was unable to be here. She's had a family emergency. So please send her some positive vibes and please follow and support her amazing work at Studio 189. And I will pass it over to Tahir to introduce himself as well. Hi, Tahir. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tahir Karmali. Uh, I am a visual artist born and raised in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, currently practicing in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Uh, and I would really like to thank the Cooper Hewitt uh, for inviting me to be part of this amazing panel um, and sending out positive vibes to Abrina and hopefully everything would turn out uh, favorably. Thanks. Thank you so much for the introduction to you. <laughs> Wonderful. So we're going to get started. And what I want to do is just give a little bit of an overview of some of the topics that intersect with the panel today. And I want to talk about Black textile cultures and the lineages that have migrated as a result. Part of what I do as a geographer is connect the dots between geographies and cultural practice and art and what that means for how we understand our present day experience and the futures that are possible that are more sustainable and equitable. So when we think about the fashion industry, um, current fashion industry, one of the main things that we think about are supply chains. And I think about supply chains very often, especially being a geographer. And so supply chain is very generally defined as the sequence of processes involved in the production and distribution of a commodity. And one of the foundational supply chains to our current fashion global industry is a triangular trade, which is a very specific supply chain, which is an economic and historical term indicating trade among three port regions, and more specifically, the transatlantic triangular trade, which was between Europe, um, the West Coast of Africa and the Americas. There's, this was a three-stage process. And the first stage of this process in the supply chain was tropical Africans were enslaved and forcibly taken to the Americas to work on plantations. And then the production part of the supply chain was that the raw materials and natural resources were extracted by the slaves as a labor force and sent to Europe to be manufactured into finished goods, which brings us to the distribution part Part of the commodities, which is these manufactured products from Europe, which are traded on the West Coast and Tensor Coasts of Africa for the enslaved Africans who created the production, right? So it's a circular trade, a triangular trade, a supply chain that involves processes, production, and distribution of commodities. And what we know to be true, which is also true in the current fashion industry, is that the distribution and commodities is what generates the most profit in the first two levels of the supply chain, the extraction of raw materials and the processing of those um, raw materials and the extraction of those raw materials generally are not the most profitable parts of the supply chain, generally the more devalued part of the supply chain. And generally, as we know with the triangular trade where black and brown bodies are abused and experience violence. So let's talk about processes, fashion processes, textile processes. I wanna start with some indigenous African textile cultural processes. So tropical West Africa, as early as the 10th, 11th century was a center of cotton production and more generally textile culture. It was a center for creating natural fibers using the materials that were around there. Cotton grew perennially in family kinship compounds. Um, 
fiber like bark cloth, which was made from bark and raffia, which was also made from a type of bark tree were common processes that was that were used across Africa and specifically in tropical West Africa. And in terms of cotton, which was really one of the main textile fabrics that was used there, there was a very um, small, long artisanal process involved in creating some of the textiles and fabrics that were made from cotton, such as weft. And weft is a popular um, textile design out of tropical Africa. It has to do with adding patterns to a ground weave. And this ground weave was usually made out of cotton. And so the way that these fabrics were made was that the cotton seeds were planted, usually in family compounds, but specifically with the heel of the foot into the soil to disturb the soil less. And as you know, if you're interested in permaculture, one of the main principles is to disturb the soil less. So there is this indigenous practice of using your heel in order to do that, to plant the seed. And then as the seed grew and it was picked, it was separated by hand or with a comb-like tool from the seeds. And it's very difficult to separate the cotton from the seeds, which is why the cotton gin was so popular. But before the cotton gin, like centuries before the cotton gin, um, tropical West Africans created this tool where you comb the fibers out and they are extracted from the seeds. And then finally, it was spun on a ceramic spindle, which they usually made out of the clay from the earth and then woven uh, on a loom that was usually made out of tree bark. So this whole process was very very long, very slow, and really about working with the earth, with the soil, with what's around you, um, rather than mass producing. And even though cotton was used for trade, as far as Madagascar, um, these sustainable indigenous practices were used for centuries in the process of cultivating cotton and creating this rich textile culture. Similarly, mud cloth, which we know is a popular design now, was a mainstay in tropical African cultures for thousands of years. And the cloth was usually cotton and it was dyed with fermented mud, indigo, or other plants, what other plants, whatever other plants were around. And now we know mud cloth as a very popular design that we see in modern decor. And it's largely divorced from this very indigenous slow practice of dyeing cotton based fabric with designs and with plants. So this intergenerational thousand years long history of natural fiber cultivation, harvesting and artisanal weaving among indigenous Africans was invaluable to European colonialists who needed skilled enslaved labor to make their profit crop model possible in the Americas. So it wasn't just that this was labor that was cheap labor, it was that it was skilled labor, it was um, skilled in terms of textiles, in terms of agriculture. And so these skills um, and these, some of these traditions traveled across the Atlantic along with the 12 million Africans who were forced into slavery and taken across this ocean to points in the Caribbean, Latin America, and North America. And some of the ways this textile and agricultural ingenuity migrated across the ocean was from very radical practices of hiding seeds in hair, hiding seeds in clothes or pockets, wherever you could, um, the way that rice started growing and being planted in North Carolina and South Carolina was that women who had been enslaved braided some rice seeds into their hair um, and carried it off of the slave ships and planted it in their slave plots. And um, planters were having a hard time with cotton and tobacco because of how specific the soil was in the Carolinas. They noticed that Africans were growing rice on their plots and started planting rice uh, as a plantation crop. So this ingenuity, um, this agricultural skill set was taken across and migrated across the ocean and was brought into the production aspect of the foundation of the supply chain. So we as in Black people were at the foundation in every level of the supply chain from seed to sow, specifically with cotton, but also with other fibers like hemp and wool as well. Cotton, however, was the first luxury commodity in the US before anything. Cotton was a luxury crop. Um, for centuries, it had been known as a special crop that did not grow in Europe, and Europeans were trying to get their hand on it. So the slave market, plantation, slave trade allowed them to create this cash crop commodity of cotton. More than 70% of all slave Black people in the South worked on pl 
um, cotton plantations by 1860. So most of the folks who were enslaved in this country were specifically um, cultivating, harvesting, producing cotton, which created the Great Great Britain to uh, dominate the global textile industry, which previously was dominated by India. Um, the Indus Valley being the origin of the cotton plant and being one of the first places that cotton was turned into fiber. So previous to um, plantation slavery and the cultivation of cotton in the Americas, the the, the Indian subcontinent was the um, largest producer of cotton. And because of the cheap labor that made cotton profitable for Great Britain, they were able to dominate this textile market through industrialization and factories. And this really created the fashion industry in the US, but also created the foundation for the US economy more generally. Banks were invested in cotton. Um, all kinds of industries were invested in cotton in the US. And so all of this was done through the colonization of Africa, which was continuing to take place, the enslavement of black Africans in the Americas and the mass cultivation, production and trade of cotton in the Americas. And so the colonialism that created this structure really transformed the planet and the global economy. Colonial powers tried to eradicate traditional indigenous textile ways through centralizing textile productions. However, as we know, these lineages migrated, evolved, developed, and have even been in some cases subsumed into mainstream American culture. So through plantation slavery and the mass production of textiles like cotton, like hemp, and other crops like tobacco, soil erosion was created across the, the U.S. South and in Haiti. By time Haiti won independence from France in 1804, most of their land was no longer arable due to the plantation economy. There was mass mass deforestation, which took away some of the climate stabilizers such as forests and trees. Um, there was the, the increasing of natural disasters because there was less uh, natural cover from forests and other biodiversity and with monocultural uh, economies such as plantation economies, that means that there is this eradication of some of the diversity in plants. So colonialism transformed the planet in, in order to create this globalized fashion economy that was based on this very violent supply chain, um, starting with the triangular trade. However, Black ingenuity or what will become Black people, what will become the Black diaspora, use some of these Indigenous influences and these Indigenous skills to innovate in the Americas. And so within these violent modes of colonial production, Indigenous African ingenuity formed a Black diaspora identity, which was largely based on craftsmanship. So in Jamaica, um, my home country, uh, enslaved African women created lace from the Lagetta tree, which is also known as the lace bark tree. So they would peel out the inside of the bark. They would stretch it out and starch it and bleach it and leave it in the sun. And it would create this lace-like material. And so they would um, weave, crochet, knit this lace-like material into these beautiful dresses and sort of ornate pieces, um, shawls that they would wear. And so even though the clothing that they were given as enslaved people was mostly scraps of fabric, cotton fabric, they were able to create this lace-like material to give them themselves some luxury in the midst of this violence. And they understood how to create cloth from the, the bark cloth cultures in tropical West Africa, but also they learned from the Arawak and Taino indigenous people who were using this um, lace bark to create rope, to create baskets, to create other types of utilitarian products and enslaved people created lace and slave masters use this fiber actually for whips. But now this, um, this culture of weaving and knitting and crocheting and lacing is so much a part of Jamaica, so much a part of Caribbean culture. And now these crochet knit dresses like Rihanna wore in her work video are popular in mainstream fashion and really are part of this lineage of ingenuity of enslaved African women. And of course, Sojourner Truth, one of the most iconic images we see of her is her holding knitting needles. She always wanted to be photographed with knitting needles. And actually she spun about a hundred 
200 pounds of wool into homespun yarn to buy her freedom. Um, she was enslaved, born into slavery. And quilting is another popular craft that is traditionally American. I grew up with quilting um, culture. Harriet Powers, who was born into slavery, was one of the first women to be recognized as a quilting artist. Her quilt was exhibited at the Athens Cotton Fair in Georgia in 1886. And of course, now we have popular artists like Faith Ringgold, who make quilts about her experience growing up in Harlem in New York that reflect Black culture, that reflect Black life. Um, and Celie Pettislow, a quilter I, I recently interviewed in Louisiana, who makes quilts using scraps of African fabric to think about her own creolized African culture and even fashion designers. This is Leon Bridges, a singer in Bode, who created a quilted pattern jacket. So it's in fashion now. And this Black uh, tradition usually held by women has been continued through generations. And we now also see it in mainstream art and fashion culture. Culture. So when we think about the di distribution side of fashion, the distribution side of textile culture, we see heavy exclusion currently and in the past of Black people. Um, Black people along with the continent of Africa more broadly have been overlooked, excluded, or completely ignored in the current fashion economy, even though we have always been central to the cultural production and the value chain. Still, we have always found a way to disrupt the status quo and our, insert ourselves and insert our value into all aspects of the supply chain. And of course, Cooper Hewitt is currently celebrating and honoring Willie Smith, who was really seen as an anomaly in the mainstream because he was the most commercially successful African-American designer in the 80s. But he was clearly inspired by his Black American upbringing and specifically the women who in his life. And we know that women in Black culture really transmit this culture across generations and specifically his sister Tuki, who was his muse. So his ideas of function, collaboration and performance art really exemplified his brand distribution model, which was clothing for the everyday people. Um, in the 70s, he went to India to start Willy Wear uh, to figure out how to create the designs that he wanted that were based on function, based on what he saw in his everyday life, what he saw when he was traveling through India. Um, and so one of the things that Willy is known to have said is that for most of these designers who have to run to Paris for color and fabric combinations, should go to church on Sunday in Harlem. So again, understanding Black life as inspiration and knowing that Black life is one of the ways that these crafts that have now been adopted into mainstream culture have come from and recognizing these lineages. So what does this mean for futures, which is also what we're talking about uh, last week, along with an organization called Seed to Shirt, we launched a campaign called We Represent Us, which is a limited edition t-shirt line with organic cotton from farmers in Burkina Faso, processed and sewn in a carbon neutral facility in Kenya, printed at a black woman owned shop in Georgia, and having four designs by black national and international artists vertically integrated and distributed by seed to shirt. So we created a sustainable t-shirt line through a completely black diaspora supply chain from seed to sew. And so this is an example of the types of fashion futures that we're seeing as a continuation of these legacies of African cultural textile traditions, as well as the future of fashion and rep recognizing that Black people have always represented ourselves in these industries and always um, affirmed our own value in these industries. And of course, um, recognizing the way that art, again, asserts Blackness into the future. This was an art piece by Alicia B. Wormsley, There Are Black People in the Future. And of course, my other two panelists, Abrima and to hear who are representative of the fashion design and art futures that are happening here and now. So again, unfortunately, Abrima can't be with us, but I'm gonna pass it over to Tahir to talk a little bit more about his practice and the way he understands some of these concepts. Tahir, please take it away. Hi, thank you. I, I, I'm really happy that you chose that photo. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great photograph. <laughs> thank you for choosing that one. Um, okay, uh, I'm Tara Karamali, and um, today I'm going to talk to you uh, about one of my projects called Strata, 
which is inspired by the Kuba cloth uh, textile that is found in uh, the Kuba kingdom in the Congo. So my first fascination with this textile uh, was within the muse museological context, uh, definitely with regards to how it's displayed in museums and how it is a very much, very much a coveted item and a coveted textile um, that is owned by a majority of museums across the United States. So here's um, an image from the Brooklyn Museum archive and over here um, at the uh, at NCMA, the North Carolina Museum of Art. Um, so Kuba cloth um, is uh, like primarily uses these uh, sort of mathematical and geometric uh, 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 patterns, which um, has sort of like prevailed throughout a lot of African textiles. But what's really unique and very interesting about it is the process of how this is this particular textile was made. Um, and looking at them, they definitely give you this very much modernist uh, sort of painting uh, as uh, something that would you would think would come out from uh, you know, contemporary post-war, post-World War, post -war um, art. Um, but definitely these objects have been made, uh, way beyond that, uh, dating back to the 1600s. Uh, so just to give you some geographical reference, uh, this here is, uh, the Congo, uh, the DRC. Uh, and here, this black spot right here would be, uh, what would be what was the Kuba kingdom um in uh in the congo right here next to the sankuru river and the kasai uh and if we move on to the next uh so kuba cloth is typically made uh by a fab uh, like uh by a fabric that is sourced from raffia and so raffia is a palm product that is essentially sort of like stripped down and uh, turned into these sort of like long fibers. And then using the warp and weft, warp and weft method, they are, these fibers are woven together. Once these, once these fibers are woven together, the uh, textile is then beaten so that it is actually given this very soft um, textile. So it feels more like a cotton rather than sort of what you typically understand raffia or um, somewhat of like a rougher textile. So the Kuba cloth itself is incredibly soft and incredibly um, malleable, and it actually sits on the body very well. Typically used for uh, adornments, uh, body adornments, for skirts, also for uh, wall works as well. So the Kuba cloth not necessarily was only uh, used for body adornment or dressing or for ceremonial use, but also used for decorative use as well within the kingdom itself. And uh, specifically for the backdrops uh, for a lot of the, um, the kings uh, and like the reigning king at the times. Um, and it is dyed with this very specific type of uh, plant, which is tool, which is a tropical plant that you typically find in the jungle. Um, and in sort of like dense uh, jungle areas. And it produces this sort of like reddish brown uh, dye, which sometimes is mixed with palm oil for, excuse me, ceremonial purposes, right? And what the, the belief was is that this particular plant harbored a, uh, uh, like harbored a power or a sort of um, healing uh, to it that would be imbued inside the textile as well. So the it was not only just used for its uh, dye process, but also its perceived uh, ability to transfer healing or transfer uh, some uh, level of spirituality uh, to the actual object itself. Uh, this is an installation of the Brooklyn Museum so that you can see sort of uh, better uh, how it is displayed in the muse museological context. Uh, I specifically reference this because I'm really interested in how these particular uh, fabrics are displayed here in the Western world and specifically here in New York City and in museums because they are often sort of seen detached from what its typical uh, use would be within the Kuba kingdom, the Kuba nation necessarily. And so I'm interested in how they are cased and how they are treated. These textiles are not light fast um, at all. Um, and they, because it's made from raffia and they've been beaten uh, quite 
rigorous, rigorously, um, they tend to disintegrate. So the period to be able to see these textiles is often very short. Uh, so a lot of museums would actually have these, these textiles rotating. So it's actually incredibly lucky if you ever do get to see one of these textiles in person in real life. Um, and this is, this is an example of how uh, the, uh, like, um, one of the Kuba kings would wear the textile over here. Um, and then you can also see sort of like panels of skirting and also uh, panels uh, that are for uh, sort of like interior um, adornment. So transferring on to the Kuba cloth in contemporary uh, sort of uh, trade, uh, we see Kuba cloth a lot sort of in companies like restoration hardware, where you would now see them sort of adorn them, uh, use, the, use the fabric to adorn like bedding or pillows or also wall work. So it's actually sort of translated, not necessarily correctly, but it kind of translated in a way that uh, is to what the, the people would have been using the textile for anyways. Um, so I was really interested personally as an artist as to like how this textile comes to being and how uh, we treat this textile and what the process of making this textile is. And then kind of looking at what our relationship to the Congo is right now and what kind of trade uh, is happening in the Congo right now. Um, and one thing that I'm very interested in uh, just like Teju is the supply chain. Uh, and more specifically, the supply chain of uh, technology and our contemporary lifestyle. So one uh, particular issue that we're facing uh, specifically in the Congo is uh, the cobalt mines. So cobalt mines, and if you don't know what cobalt is, it's a mineral that, um, uh, sorry, it's a heavy metal that's used primarily for cell phone batteries. Um, and these batteries uh, use quite a lot of cobalt and a lot of cobalt does come from the Congo through these somewhat illegal mines and somewhat legal mines as well. Um, and one particular issue is that a lot of children work in these mines because of like how narrow they are to sort of like pull out the cobalt from, uh, uh, from the mine itself. And here's another image of what the mines kind of look like because they have to destroy a lot of the forests. They have to destroy uh, quite a bit of jungle. Uh, to just unearth this particular mineral. And when we talk about the supply chain, you can see here how the mining sort of starts here in the DRC and this particular material would move across East Africa into China and then re, uh, and then, uh, what is it? Uh, refined in China and then distributed uh, and then finally the end product ends up here in the US in the form of an Apple iPhone or a Samsung Galaxy Note or um, a Windows Surface uh, uh, object. So a lot, of, a lot of us unknowingly are holding a piece of Africa in our pocket every day. Um, so with knowing this and kind of using the lessons that I learned from not only the museological sort of uh, display of Kuba cloth, but also the process of making Kuba cloth and also um, the knowledge of the supply chain of cobalt. Um, I started to work with a village uh, very close to the Kasai province uh, to create undyed raffia textiles that I later imbued with the cobalt that I would buy from, well, I would source from dead cell phone batteries off of eBay. So I would get a bunch of uh, cell phone batteries and uh, extract the cobalt and then just how they would use the tool and the sort of sense of power that is sort of imbuing uh, the textile is to actually sort of like create an object that sort of describes, you know, our history uh, with the supply chain, um, specifically to do with cobalt and also, you know, the slow degradation of, uh, of classical uh, uh, Kuba cloth production. Um, and just to give you a quick reference, this is actually how um, cobalt and the lithium ion battery sort of looks like. The cobalt is actually attached to this copper foiling uh, 
And that copper foiling is then what I pull out and extract the cobalt and also so impart some of the carbon and the uh, lithium as well. And uh, I create a uh, uh, sort of this essentially, which is then I oxidize and I turn that into a cobalt uh, dye sort of sublimate. And so but the work, the word strata really kind of references sort of like the rock, but also references history. Um, and sort of like talking about this kind of recurring histories of like extraction of material from Africa, whether it be uh, people or, you know, and also in regards to the Congo rubber um, and other materials that are just sort of like pulled from the continent without any sort of like remorse whatsoever. So a lot of the objects themselves are sort of like layered or reference uh, shrouding or death or um, these sort of like hung bodies on the wall or um, in some sense, kind of this uh, blanket type uh, quilting uh, reference as well about how we discuss our history and how we put that into the textile and imbue it. Um, personally, I did not want to appropriate necessarily the Kuba Kingdom's uh, um, way of using geometry. Um, as a style, I just wanted to uh, really kind of show the staining of this dye onto the textile itself, because I feel that the textile as a carrying material um, harbored enough um, sort of like weight to it that when it is stained and it is sort of like placed these like sheets of copper on it, um, that it kind of creates a sort of like abstract landscape um, feel um, onto the textile. Uh, but also gives it this sort of like weighted body feel. So you're not necessarily kind of looking into the object for a geometric or muse uh, musical reference, but you're actually looking at sort of like a landscape reference and sort of a treatment to the textile rather than sort of an adornment of the textile. Um, while the Kuba people definitely were concentrated on, on the textile as an adornment piece, but I'm more thinking about the textile as something that is like harboring a, a staining from our history. Okay. And so that is me. That was very interesting, incredibly interesting. Um, and I wanna ask you some questions. Okay before we open it up to audience questions. The first question I have is just, how did you get interested in this specific Cuba textile culture? Like, how did you come to find this particular textile and go to understand more about the research? I would love to know more about that. Um, I have always been really interested in textiles. Um, and a lot of my work references like fiber and textile. Um, and uh, I was, when I moved to New York City, um, and I went to the Met and I was expecting there to be like a really large, like, you know, Africa or East Africa, West, you know, and it's this tiny little dinky room that they have. Uh, it's like really small. Uh, but what grabbed my eye was the Kuba cloth itself, right? Like the, it, it, the way that it's treated in the museum, it was just, you know, it, 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 because it's such a fragile textile, um, and it's something that is so coveted. Um, it was so interesting for me to see it. And I was just taken by, you know, the, the geometry and the breaks in the geometry um, and artistically just sort of like the execution of those textiles are, are gorgeous because they, some, they hand sew like a lot of these textiles to give it like a little bit of like tufting um, and it's like hand tufting and in, these, in, in these geometries, uh, it's not easy and these things date you know, 1635 to like 17, you know, they're very old. Um, and I really was taken by them. And when I started to learn more about the textile and when I started getting into sort of like making my own textiles, um, I was also doing a lot of research with regards to the, the cobalt supply chain. And then that just kind of like clicked together. It just seemed like, oh, this is, this is a contemporary issue that I can use a process uh, to actually uh, discuss something that can be also making commentary about like the muse museological display of like African textiles as well. 
Does that make sense? Yes. And my next question is sort of about that, some of those processes. I think it's important that you mention this sort of centuries long and continual extraction from Africa, but also this like consumption of Africa that we all have Africa in our pockets, or even the idea that most artifacts from the continent are in museums in Europe and the US. And I wonder if you could talk about, especially as an artist, this idea of the types of extraction, the extraction of raw materials, the extraction of culture, maybe even the extraction of uh, artists in the museum context, Thoughts about that? Yeah, um, I do have thoughts about that. <laughs> um, uh, es especially with regards to sort of um, artists and how uh, how some artists are allowed to uh, perform uh, in the music in in the museum context. You know, to sort of like um, give light to certain issues and also to sort of like also silence other issues, which is sort of like defeats the purpose of inviting, you know, artists and like when they have, whenever they do this sort of, you know, every few years, it's the Africa exhibition, contemporary African art exhibition, and then how they decide to sort of like, uh, frame that work is, uh, very specific and how it, it and how they extract these ideas and then move those artists to, um, Western institutions so that they can actually capitalize on that um, is something that I think about a lot and something that I am also personally in conflict about. Um, but with regards to just materials in general, um, a lot of people are just completely unaware as to uh, firstly where Africa is, which is like a problem. Um, I was at you know my local bar and I asked people to, add, to name three African countries and you know it's like like two like Egypt is what you get Egypt Morocco <laughs> yeah. e Egypt Egypt Morocco and uh, Nigeria, Nigeria. if they've gotten those emails you know yeah. that's what they understand Nigeria to be yeah exactly or Somalia you know because uh, yeah so there is just a general ignorance and like they, they think that Africa doesn't really have anything to uh, offer the world uh, but have like high key just been profiting off of um off of the continent and the landscape for the longest time. And it's deliberately engineered that way that, you know, a lot of people around the world are constantly gonna perceive African people as sort of uh, in the backseat and as something that is a, a, a continent that constantly, need, constantly needs development. And that's actually how um, that entire system works is because everyone believes that Africa constantly needs development. And then while they do that, they just exploit everything. They just like pull everything from under you and you don't really realize it because nobody necessarily wants to talk about these complicated histories anymore. Yeah, and also I think, you know, history is biased in that it is largely from a Western view or at least mainstream history is largely from a Western view. So when you think about the history of cotton, which I was recently doing research on for like thousands of years, Europe was not a part of cotton textile. There were supply chains and trades where Europe was minimal if even involved at all. And so even the way we understand the history of production, most of our feelings about supply chains are from a Western perspective. And so necessarily Africa is going to be seen as this place that needs constant development rather than this place that for centuries has produced, you know, most of uh, the world's agricultural developments. Yeah. Um, so I know we have some questions from the audience. So I just wanna ask one more question, which is not a super complicated question and then I'll open up to the audience, which is since this Cuba textile is made from mostly natural materials, you mentioned that it disintegrates. When it disintegrates, is it able to go back to the earth without poisoning the earth as a result? Not mine uh, because it has cobalt in it. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, technically it is oxidized and can be, but um, the way that that has to be uh, treated is very different. Uh, but yes, no, uh, with the tool dyes and with the raffia that naturally goes back in. And that's actually one of the most interesting things about uh, the museological sort of display of these textiles is that they're actually designed to disintegrate, right? They're designed so that, you know, we know that there's going to be another king coming. We know that there's going to be another representative coming. We know that something, you know, is happening. It is actually a textile that works in congruence with the society and with um, how the the how how the Kuba kingdom 
uh, operates, right? So these things naturally sort of disintegrate and they are like ephemeral objects, right? So it, the way that we treat them now is this sort of like holding on to a history that largely has been eradicated because of, you know, colonialism. And we're just kind of like holding on to these these sort of like remnants of, uh, of memory because a lot of the a lot of the kingdom has like largely been destroyed. Um, so that's also kind of a huge part of that um, commentary is this kind of like um, this sort of this treasured object that is supposed to actually disintegrate. Yeah, and this idea of impermanence, like part of the museum and Western culture is this idea of something being entrenched forever and most things in life are impermanent. So let me- I mean, uh, permanence, permanence gives me anxiety. Um, <laughs> As it should. It, it just gives me a lot of anxiety. I'm just like, I like impermanence. That's, that's fine. I can deal with that. I, I agree with that. Yeah. So we have one question. Um, I don't know if you have the answer to this. I don't know if I have the answer to this. Where did the process of wax print originate? How did the Dutch come to dominate this textile industry? Um, okay, so uh, you should definitely look at Yinke Shinobara's work. I think like Yinke's work it definitely like talks about this. Um, but uh, from my dealings with the research uh, with regards to sort of like Vlisco and like these um, sort of major uh, wax print uh, batik um, textiles, it actually originated uh, from uh, Indonesia and uh, the Dutch has, you know, colonized Indonesia. Uh, and that process was taken to the Netherlands and then um, no one in the Netherlands really wanted that. And the market that actually wanted that was predominantly West Africa. Okay, um, next question. Where can we learn more about plants and trees being used in fashion or to create textiles? Um, one resource that immediately comes to mind that I have used is called African Textiles by John Mack. And he goes through some of the traditional indigenous African textile cultures, all of which are from trees and plants. And to him, I'm sure you have some other resources. There are a few, I just can't remember them offhand. Um, definitely a lot of textile books on, uh, on African textile for sure, um, especially about like heritage textiles. Um, and also I feel like there is an online resource that you can use um, that I, is escaping me, uh, but I will find that out and then I'll let you know. And also, um, like, uh, before 1960, a lot of textiles and fabrics in general were made from natural materials or animals, such as wool. Um, and so, also, like, if you look in archives um, of fashion houses, of museums, you know, you can see what materials things are made from, and it's very easy to just find what that source is and do research on that. Um, in terms of things like lace bark, which I mentioned, which is a little bit more under researched, there are tons of blogs. Like if you could think of anything, you could just type it in like fabric made from this plant and there might be something happening. And I know um, there's a huge uh, movement of using biomaterials for fabric and fiber. Mm -hmm. um, so there's now more information about people designing with moss and other types of things. Also the dyes themselves are all like natural dyes, especially like one like henna or like turmeric and also obviously indigo and, and all of the um, dyes that go into making mud cloth are really interesting as well. And also like kutch and like different types of like barks that are used. Um, all over Africa to get, you know, really interesting colors. Um, one of the things about like, uh, while I was doing some research and I was talking to a very close friend of mine um, that works in the fashion industry, more specifically concentrating on heritage textiles is that we're actually um, facing a situation where there, the production of heritage textile in Africa isn't necessarily meeting the demand um, for around the world. Um, especially with like 
you know, organizations like, or like companies like um, Restoration Hardware and so on, and you even walk through Williamsburg, uh, you will see um, a plethora of these sort of stores that have these textiles. Um, they're actually now starting to be produced in China um, and in especially sort of uh, Kuba cloths and certain Kuba cloths and certain things. So it's definitely something that you need to look out for in terms of like who you trust. And sometimes they just sort of like ship it to Mali and sell it from a someone in Mali uh, to make it come across as, uh, as it being authentic. And whenever you do buy these sort of like textiles to make sure that you're getting um, sometimes they artificially wear the textile, like wear it out. And so when you buy some of these textiles to make sure that, especially with indigo dyed cloth that the indigo still kind of comes off onto your fingers. Like, you know, when you buy new jeans or whatever, those artificially faded ones are most likely something that has been produced um, uh, incorrectly and likely have been produced in China which is worrying because it is an African heritage textile. And it is, it is, well, you know, a lot of my project deals with like the appropriation of uh, a process. Um, it does work differently when now sort of you're capitalizing on like a trend, especially an interior design trend where it's like modernist, but rough and ready. I think the other thing about capitalizing on a process is that it naturally devalues the process because it has to be mass produced. Mm. And what makes these sustainable is that they are small batch, that there are not hundreds being produced or thousands being produced on an assembly line. It's the care, the craftsmanship. So I think part of that is also lost in the mass production and this consumption culture of like, everyone wants a hundred of these. Mm. Um, so anyways, it was, Amazing hearing your presentation. I look forward to following your work. Thank you so much for joining this panel. Much. Thank you to Cooper Hewitt for having us. And I know there is part two of the symposium coming up in the fall. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Thank you for joining us today and have a good afternoon. Thank you so much.